Shalom. I'm Eddie Chumney from Hebraic Heritage Ministries, and we thank you today for watching the Hebraic Roots Network. We are doing teachings on the weekly Torah portion, and I'm going to be sharing with you this week's Torah portion, which is Teruma, which is Exodus chapter 25, verse 1, through Exodus in chapter 27 and verse 19. And in this Torah portion is where the instruction is given to make the tabernacle that the children of Israel had with them in the wilderness and the details about building that tabernacle. And ultimately, in order for the tabernacle to be built, the people are instructed to come in to freely give offerings to help in the construction of the tabernacle. And so let's look at Exodus in chapter 25 and verses 8 and 9 where it says, Let them make me a sanctuary, a mikdash, that I may dwell, shikan, among them. According to all that I show you, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. I want you to notice that it does not say, make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in it. Because the God of Israel desires to commune and dwell with his people. So the purpose of the tabernacle is that I may dwell among them, not in it. And so the next thing we need to realize is this tabernacle that the Lord commanded Moses to build in the wilderness is a prophetic blueprint of the heavenly tabernacle. And then in Hebrews, in chapter 8 and verse 5, we can see the following. Who serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. See, says he, that you make all things according to the pattern shown to you in the mount that it served as a shadow of heavenly things. And so here in Hebrews in chapter 8, it says in verse 1, We have a high priest, that is Yeshua, the Messiah, who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, that Yeshua is a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched in not man. So Yeshua is the high priest of the heavenly tabernacle, and that heavenly tabernacle was made by God. It was not made by man. And so the one that the Lord commanded Moses to build in the wilderness was a shadow or it was a blueprint of the one in heaven. And so we can see how heaven is a tabernacle in Revelation in chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 through 3 it is written, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth was passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And so... In speaking of the new heaven and the new earth, John says that the tabernacle of God is with men. And 
so the God of Israel wants us to understand about the Messiah, his redemptive work, his kingdom, and the ways of his kingdom. And so for this reason, the children of Israel were instructed to construct a tabernacle that is patterned after the heavenly one so that they would have a earthly representation of understanding spiritual things. And so then not only is heaven a tabernacle, but this is a spiritual picture of us in our personal lives, in our body, and how the God of Israel made and sees us. Because the tabernacle had three major components. It had an outer court, it had a holy place, and it had the Holy of Holies. And so human beings, we are made like the tabernacle. We have an outer court. It's our physical body. And then we have a holy place, which is our soul. And our soul consists of our emotions and it consists of our will, but the holy place is our heart. And everything, as Yeshua explained, comes forth and is birthed from the heart. And so man has three components. He's spirit, soul, and body, even as the tabernacle had three components. It had the holy of holies, it had the holy place, and it had the outer court. And so our bodies and us living in this earth is likened to a tabernacle. And so we can see this in 2 Corinthians in chapter 5. And in verses 1 through 4, it is written, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle, that is this earthly body, do groan, being burdened not for that which we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. And so our eternal body is a heavenly body. This physical body is not our eternal body. We have a heavenly body that is waiting for us, which God made that is the one that we will be living in for all eternity. And so then we can see in 1 Corinthians in chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, Know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Now we're going to look at, we're going to look once again in the book of Corinthians. And we're going to look at 1 Corinthians in chapter 6 and verses 19 and 20. What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you? which you have of God, and you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are of God's. And so we have that the tabernacle that the Lord commanded to be built here in this Torah portion, that that tabernacle is a prophetic picture of the true tabernacle in heaven, but it's also a picture of our physical earthly bodies because the God of Israel gave 
a physical representation to help us understand spiritually his kingdom of heaven, what it is, how it operates, and also he wants us to understand and know about our personal lives, our personal bodies, because ultimately what the God of Israel desires is he wants to have personal relationship with us. And we can see how he desires to have that personal relationship through the instruction of the building of the Ark of the Covenant. And so in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 10, it says that they make an Ark of Shittin wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length, and a cubit and a half the breadth, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. You shall overlay it with pure gold. And then it goes on to say in Exodus chapter 25, verses 21 and 22, you shall put the mercy seat above the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. Now, here's the ultimate purpose. Verse 22, and there I will meet with you. I will commune with you from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I give you in commandment unto the children of Israel. Remember in the instruction in Exodus chapter 25 verse 8, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And so the dwelling place of the tabernacle is above the mercy seat. So this tells us that the God of Israel wants an intimate, personal relationship with him in what he calls the Holy of Holies, and he wants to commune or he wants to have fellowship with us. And so then he wants us to come before him with a willing heart. And so this is how he instructed that the gifts to build the tabernacles were to be brought with a willing heart. Exodus in chapter 25 verses 1 and 2, it says, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me a offering. And so in Hebrew it's Teruma, and this is the name of the Torah portion, Teruma. Bring me a teruma of every man that gives willingly with his heart, and you shall take my offering. And so ultimately, the God loves and he desires that what we do, we do from a pure heart because we are told by Yeshua in Matthew in chapter 5 and verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So he wants to have communion. He wants to have personal relationship with us, but he wants our hearts to be willing and pure before him. And so with that thought, we have the scripture from Psalm in chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. Who shall abide in your tabernacle? Who shall dwell in your holy hill? So the holy hill that he's referring to is Mount Zion, Mount Zion. He that walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his neighbor. Now, if you do these negative things toward your neighbor, how does that happen? It comes when you have evil heart and evil thoughts toward your neighbor. And so we have a parallel to Psalm chapter 15 to 
Psalm chapter 24, beginning in verse 3. Who will ascend into the hill of the Lord? Now, that's the highest place in God. And so that is Mount Zion. And who will stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, and who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. And so because God wants clean hands and a pure heart, clean hands is the things that we do. Pure heart is our motive. And so then the God of Israel, this is why he instructed for those that bring an offering before him, let it be done, Exodus chapter 25, verse 2, bring me an offering of every man that gives it willingly with his heart. And so we can also see this principle in Exodus in chapter 35, in verses 4 and 5, Moses spake unto the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take you from among you an offering, a teruma, unto the Lord, whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it an offering of the Lord. And it continues on. So now uh, we can also see then what the God of Israel says regarding the heart attitude that we're to have in our giving in Deuteronomy in chapter 15. And we're going to read verses 7 through 9. If there be among you a poor man of one of your brethren within any of the gates in your land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not harden your heart nor shut your hand from your poor brother. You see, if you harden your heart, you don't have a pure heart. You don't have clean hands. You can't ascend to the hill of the Lord. But you will open your hand wide unto him, and you shall surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wants. Beware that there be not a thought of your wicked heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release, is at hand, and you be and your eye be evil against your poor brother, and you give him not, and he cry unto the Lord against you, and it will be a sin against you. Verse 10, but you will surely give him, and your heart shall not be grieved when you give it to him. Don't give it grudgingly. Don't give it of necessity, because that for this thing the Lord your God shall bless you in all your works, in all that you put your hand unto. So we see the Torah tells us that we're to bring our gifts before the Lord with a willing heart, not grudgingly, nor of necessity, that if our brother is in need, that we will be generous toward him and that we not harden our heart and that we open up our hands and give what we are able to help our brother. This is what the Torah teaches. And so now we're going to look at Psalm 112. Psalm 112 says, Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that fears the Lord, that delights greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth, the generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Under the upright there arises light in the darkness. He's gracious, full of compassion, and righteous. A good man shows favor, and he lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he will not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. And so blessed is that man that fears the Lord, that delights greatly in his commandments. His seed will be mighty 
upon the earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed because a good man shows favor and lends, and he will guide his affairs with discretion. And so this is what Paul is teaching in the book of Corinthians. And so we have Paul's teaching or instruction in 2 Corinthians in chapter 9. And with this Torah background, with what's said in the Psalms, you can see that the instruction that Paul is given here in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 is from the Torah. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 in verse 6. But this I say, he that sows sparingly shall reap sparingly. He that sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. This is associated with what you sow, you reap. Every man according as he has purposed in his heart, let him give. And so as he's purposed in his heart, so what was in our Torah portion in Exodus chapter 25, verse 2? Bring me a offering every man that gives willingly with his heart. So now Paul goes on to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, Every man according as he's purposed in his heart, let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. Well, that's what Deuteronomy chapter 15 says. Don't do it grudgingly or of necessity. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. As it is written, and now Paul now quotes from Psalm 112 in verse 9. He has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness remains forever. Now he that ministers seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. And so we see then in the construction of the tabernacle, it had an outer court, a holy place, and a holy of holies. And so we see that these are different levels of holiness. And the lowest level of holiness is the outer court. The higher level of holiness is the holy place. But the greatest level of holiness is the holy of holies. So now in Revelation in chapter 21, when we have the new heavens and the new earth, what we're being shown is the holiest place of all. We're being shown the new Jerusalem. So the new Jerusalem is likened unto the Holy of Holies, and the new Jerusalem is called a great and a high mountain. And so that's why it says in Psalm chapter 24 and verse 3, Who will ascend unto the hill of the Lord? And so that's going to be Mount Zion. That's going to be the new Jerusalem. He that he has a clean hands and a pure heart. And so that's why the New Jerusalem, the city of the bride, is that set-apart holy place. Revelation in chapter 21, in verse 9, it says, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. Verse 10, He carried me away in the Spirit to a great and a high mountain. And He showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And so where in the tabernacle did God commune and where did he speak with Moses? Where was his glory when he spoke with Moses? It was in the Holy of Holies. And so we see the New Jerusalem has the glory of God. And it's like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And so uh, we can see that as the tabernacle had levels, there are levels in heaven. 
and not everybody who's going to spend eternity with the Messiah has equal status. Paul explained this to us in 1 Corinthians in chapter 15. In verse 35, he says, But some man will say, How are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? And so he's going to answer the question, What type of a body do we have when we receive a resurrected body? And so here's how he answers the question. All flesh is not the same flesh. So what's our resurrected body like? We all don't have the exact same resurrected body. He then uses the analogy. There is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fish, and another of birds. There are celestial bodies, there are bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the terrestrial is one, and the glory of the celestial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. So what does he keep repeating here to answer the question? How are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? Well, what he keeps repeating is glory, that the glory of the celestial is one, the glory of the terrestrial is another. There's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. So what type of body do we have? We have a glorified body. And what does that glorified body do? It gives off light, but it gives off different degrees of light because it says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 41, one star differs from another star in glory, in light that it gives off. So is the resurrection of the dead. You remember, Abraham was told that his descendants are like the stars. Well, not every star gives off the same amount of light. Some stars give off a greater light. And so how do we have light itself when we believe in Yeshua as the Messiah? He is the light of the world. And so we have light because he is light. But then once we receive the light, then we have to live the light. And this is um, how we live our lives in service under the God of Israel, seeking to do his will. And so the higher we do his will, the more we keep his commandments, the more we have his light in us and works through us because he said that we are the light of the world. And we're going to let our light shine so that men may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So this is the lesson we learned from this Torah portion. Shalom.